Okay, right now, here we're going again from the top. And this time, the first violins. Uh, I want you to plug, uh, plug the instruments into the gas main because uh, I'm not getting the sound I'm liking. And the wives what form in the backing group, uh, let you come round to the front of me where I can keep my eye on you. That's better. Now, here we are going. Stop now. Stop now when I'm telling... Listen, stop! Shut up! Thank you. Now, I'm counting you in with the well-known counting teams. Here we go. One, two... Oh, no. What come after two? Five. Edie, Edie, Edie on me, most amazing man there's ever been. He the general, the president, the king of the sea. Edie, Edie, Edie on me. Look at the history and packed with men What rising to the top and getting chopped again No one fathom in the secret of the whole damn thing You gotta give the population something to see Edie, Edie, Edie on me Most amazing man there's ever been He the general, the president, the king of the scene Edie, Edie Take Hitler, Stalin, Attila, the nun. No one got a good word for a single one. Where these first class geniuses all going wrong? They never got the population singing along. Edie, 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 I'm me. Most amazing man there's ever been. He the general, the president, he king of the scene. Edie, 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 I'm me. Listen. With the world famous Kampala Glee Club mind keeping in the damn background? What the hell going on here? It looking like some kind of musical coup to me. That better. Three people more than enough for a quartet anyhow. Edie, Edie, Edie on me. Most amazing man there's ever been. He the general, the president, the king of the scene. Edie, Edie, Edie on me. A modern leader got a twist and shout Gotta tell the people, let it all hang out If you don't want to vanish with a boot up the bomb You gotta give the population something to hum Edie, Edie, You still Amin, crowding the star! <laughs> Edie, General, the President, he king of the sea Edie, 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 I mean Hmm, that a pretty good voice you got there that voice possibly taking you right to the top of the charts. Yes, sir, ma'am, every chance you get into the number one spot on the Uganda hit parade with a voice like that. You could be the next Engelbert Bassi. You could be the new Zulu. <coughs> Pity the world only needing one new star, really. Idi, 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 I mean the most amazing man that the world has seen. Now the general, the president, the king of the scene. Idi, 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 I mean oh, this girl singing a piece of cake. Earlier in this course, we saw how the ever-growing image Africa was utilized to reinforce the existing colonial hierarchies and oppress the colonized through various mediums. Often, the characteristics attributed to Africans was conjured up by Europeans who had not even set foot in Africa, relying on inaccurate or embellished accounts of travelers and missionaries. Remember that the image Africa did become more nuanced by the end of the 19th and into the 20th centuries. But the basic framework for keeping, for keeping colonial tendencies remained intact and it continued to keep those tendencies within the mainstream of European popular entertainment well into the 20th century and even after the process of decolonization in Africa had commenced. Negative imaging of Africa through the dark continent trope continues unabated in Western cultural productions. While colonial historiography has been successfully challenged by various African historians and most contemporary historical literature no longer entertains such biases, the negative representation and stereotyping of Africa and Africans have continued specifically in Western film through to the post-colonial era, with Hollywood as the biggest assembly line for this warped image production, dissemination and consolidation. In this final lecture, 
We will look at how Hollywood has sought to keep such an image alive and to what end. We will discover how post-colonial Africa and Africans are depicted by Hollywood by discussing various examples of films released in the second half of the 20th century and early 21st century. Now before we start, it's important to understand that what is meant when we talk about Hollywood. Who or what are we referring to? It's an easy mistake to think that Hollywood is limited to the film industry located in Los Angeles, California. However, Okaka Opio Dokatum maintains that Hollywood has been constantly changing due to a number of factors such as an explosion in transnational investment, the various nationalities that perform in Hollywood films, and the increasingly porous nature of national boundaries. Thus, while there's still a physical place called Hollywood, the name has become a cultural space that includes many producers, directors, actors, and audi audiences within and beyond the United States of America. Elizabeth Ezra and Terry Rowden assert that Hollywood, which for many critics has become a cynic joke for popular films as such, has both influenced and been influenced by the flows of cultural exchange that are transforming the ways people the world over are making and watching films. So, while Hollywood is American in its origin and location, it's very international across the Western world in its production and marketing. In this lecture, the term Hollywood will be used broadly to refer to US and British film productions that, pro that project British colonial and US neo-colonial cultural hegemony, as well as other Western films about Africa that adhere to the various Western templates of representing Africa in the classical Hollywood narrative tradition. Since Hollywood's focus is maximizing profit, its purpose is not necessarily being faithful in the way in which stories, histories, or places are represented in film, but whether those stories can generate a profit. Due to this profit drive, it can generally be said that audience expectations and the consequent box office returns are what drives Hollywood. Even when a Hollywood director promises to tell the true story, profit considerations mediate the storytelling. Because Hollywood is what Dokatum calls an amorphous cultural production empire, it's difficult to hold it accountable for its derogatory depictions of Africa. As the expressive wing of the Western cultures, Hollywood's negative stereotypes of Africans are manifestations of wider racist cultural projections in the age of Western hegemony. As we've seen in the earlier lecture of Jesse Owens and Hitler, the heart of the Hollywood film industry is the consolidation of whiteness as the standard mechanism of othering which is inextricably linked with the birth of Hollywood cinema. Critical race studies scholar Professor Daniel Bernardi postulates that in Hollywood whiteness remained the norm by which all others fail by comparison. He notes that while the meaning of race might have shifted or evolved, whiteness remained supreme, maintaining its hegemony in Hollywood from the birth of cinema to the contemporary era. This means that whiteness directly and indirectly controls all aspects of Hollywood production, including casting and editing. Representations of whiteness in Hollywood films about Africa bring to the fore the power relations between what Edward Said calls the Occident, or the West, and the Orient, the East which in the context can be broadened to incorporate Africa. Saeed argues that the relationship between the Occident and Orient is a relationship of power, of domination, of varying degrees of a complex hegemony. The power relations between the West and Africa operate in several different capacities in these films. First is the more visible power structure between white and black characters within the narrative. Second is the power relation between Western audiences and images of black Africa on screen. The images and ideas of Africa on Hollywood screens have always been an imaginative construction of the Western filmmaker's mind. Like colonialism, 
The intention of early filmmakers had nothing to do with creating a sense of equality between black and white people. These filmmakers built an unequal race representation structure to which many of Hollywood films still subscribe. The racial hierarchy employed by Hollywood is informed by the notion of human evolutionism introduced by the European Enlightenment project and spread throughout Africa during colonialism. The third manner in which power relations between the West and Africa operate is the inequality of the power structure between Western audiences and black African images. Since the inception of film, unequal power relations between black and white characters on screen has been fueled by dominant Western discourse. As Alison Swank puts it, race representations are dictated by popularized Western discourse and proliferated through Hollywood. Representations affect the reality of people's lived experiences every day. Western discourse can manipulate how the dominant and dominated are viewed. Thus, it's important to extract their cultural meanings. In addressing the power relation between Western discourse and images of black Africa, it's important to consider the audience. Racial representations only become meaningful through the gaze. Cultural meanings are linked to images through the interpretation made by the gazer. The perception audiences create from representations in film are not based on a finite set of images. Rather, they are a combination of images drawn from one's position in space and time. Western discourses on Africa have rearranged images according to the popular ideas of periods in time, but the ideas still give preference to certain dominant representations. Images created during the European imperialism project have more or less remained unchanged in popular Western modes of thought. Ruth Mayer argues that imperialist frameworks of representation, representation are still effective today. At least, in one respect, the gigantic project of colonialism did work, forcing most diverse regions, traditions and cultures in Africa into one symbolic system. Colonial rule brought about an imperialist framework of representation that's still effective today, even if the effects are not necessarily what they used to be. Now, New Wave Hollywood Africa Films describes a new generation of films beginning in the mid-1990s characterized by highly developed African characters and dealing with serious African issues as opposed to the underdeveloped African characters and the safari narratives of earlier films. In her introduction to the volume of essays Hollywood's Africa after 1994, Mary Ellen Higgins says she chose 1994 because it was the year of the Rwandan genocide as well as the inauguration of Nelson Mandela as president of South Africa. These two events have inspired many Hollywood films about Africa. She considers 1994 also to be the marker for new humanitarian films about Africa. She says Hollywood films set after 1994 present us with images of humanitarian crisis and questions of Western intervention. Also in this period, a new humanitarian agenda appeared in the West with the birth of numerous humanitarian NGOs as Western nations pursued a rights-based humanitarian consensus. Manthea Diawara refers to the genre as humanitarian Tarzanism or Afro-pessimist films from Hollywood. These films mostly focus on human rights as they attempt to articulate the voices and concerns of ordinary Africans. However, can a global business of entertainment entity such as Hollywood, whose only goal it is to profit from the production of films, lay any claim to be the moral soundboard for the protection of human rights? This question is raised by Joyce Ashun Tantang when she writes, the Appalachian human rights form is itself debatable, since Hollywood movies have to negotiate between advocacy for global human rights, presumed audience preference, and box office figures, which may in turn trump the very rights the films are meant to uphold. New Wave Hollywood Africa films can be grouped into five broad categories 
namely medical conspiracy forms, celebrity humanitarianism or celebrity colonialism forms, militainment, so-called great lives biopics, and colonial nostalgia. Now before we proceed, it must be remembered that the new wave Hollywood Africa films do not necessarily belong to any one of these categories. Instead, more than one category can overlap in one film. Medical conspiracy films represent Africa as a place where mysterious viruses are produced and then spread to the rest of the world, especially the US, via globalization. Thus, Africa is represented as a threat, a breeding ground of chaos which is best to be enjoyed from a distance, otherwise, as Mayer puts it, once you get too close, you might be attacked or sick. An example of such films is Outbreak of 1994 directed by Wolfgang Peterson, starring Dustin Hoffman, Donald Sutherland and Morgan Freeman. The film, that plays out the, anxieties, the film plays out the anxieties of America in relation to an Africa long constructed in the West as the source of deadly viruses. The plot involves a new virus based on the Ebola virus, only much deadlier, called the Mutaba virus. Contracted from monkeys in the Mutaba River Valley in the then Zaire, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, this virus kills within three days and has a 100% mortality rate. It nearly wipes out the inhabitants of the Mutaba Valley, including a contingent of US soldiers. In the beginning of the film, the village witch doctor says it's not good to kill the trees attributing the outbreak to deforestation, which already brings in another stereotype of Africans as being simplistic and superstitious. Renegade General Do Donald McClintock, portrayed by Donald Sutherland, decides to bomb the army camp in order to contain the virus from spreading to the US. 27 years later, in 1994, the virus resurfaces again in the Mutaba Valley and crosses the ocean to a small town in California through a pet monkey brought from Zaire. The virus that first spread through physical contact later becomes airborne and infection spread rapidly. Although a cure for the virus is being sought, McClintock tries to hinder the research on the cure and instead again orders the bombing of the entire town to contain the national spread of the virus. The cure is found and the general's conspiracy is, ex is exposed. This film, however, fits into Mayer's new virus trope of representing Africa as the source of incurable diseases, to the point where Africans, even those living in the US, are all feared to be carriers. For example, in 2014, following the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, panic and xenophobia against Africans in American cities especially in New York, ensued. There were strong rumors in the US that the deadly Zaire strain of Ebola in West Africa had gone airborne, like the fictional Motaba virus. The paranoia got to such a point that senior US officials, including then-President Barack Obama, had to reassure Americans that it wasn't airborne. Although the virus manifested largely in three West African countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone and Guinea, all West Africans, indeed all Africans, were suspected by many to be carri carriers. Americans cancelled trips to Africa as a whole, supposedly on the still existent misconception that Africa is a country. This sort of panic is an example of how fact and fiction can quickly emerge and be can quickly merge and be confused for each other in the Western understanding of Africa. Other contemporary Hollywood films that fall within the new wave Hollywood Africa project a certain message which promotes a certain cause with the help of a star in the leading role. A great example of celebrity colonialism is Beyond Borders a movie with a message that exposes the plight of refugees in famine-stricken Ethiopia during the 1980s, with extended action in Cambodia and Chechnya. 
The film features Academy Award winning celebrity actor and United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees Goodwill Ambassador Angelina Jolie, who, according to Forbes, became the most powerful celebrity on earth in 2009, having dethroned Oprah. Although the disclaimer at the end of the film is not based on a true story, it's actually partially based on Joey's own philanthropic and political engagement with issues of poverty in Africa and elsewhere. Conveniently, the film was released together with her travelogue called Notes from My Travels, Visits with Refugees in Africa, Cambodia, Pakistan and Ecuador, which chronicles her humanitarian work abroad. The film recycles the colonial Africa cliché of a jungle romance between the white humanitarian hero Dr. Nicholas Callahan, played by Clive Owen, and the white humanitarian heroine, journalist Sarah Jordan, portrayed by Jolie, in the midst of famine, war, and death in Africa. As Dokotom states, the film also romanticizes poverty as material for entertainment, economic, and moral capital, especially for its leading actress Angelina Jolie, the celebrity humanitarian persona. Thus, the film uses poverty, African poverty, to accentuate the feeling of the film, thus enabling its rich audiences to relate to the protagonists while sympathizing with the impoverished African other who is at least a safe distance away in distant, in distant Africa. Another example of celebrity colonialism is the 2004 film Hotel Rwanda, directed by Irishman Terry George and starring African-American actor Don Cheadle as the non-fictional character of hotel owner Paul Rusesa Bagina. The story is based on real events that occurred during the Rwandan genocide of 1994. It follows how Rusesa Bagina saved the lives of 1,268 Tutsis and moderate Hutus during the genocide by providing them with refuge in his hotel, the Hotel des Mille Collines. The film brought the story of the 1994 Rwandan genocide into the international spotlight 10 years after the fact and did its part in exposing the betrayal of Rwanda by the international community, who were too busy debating whether the ki killings did in fact amount to genocide or not. Indeed. The film is so central to the Rwandan genocide in public memory that Dokutum asserts that it is rare for some of us today to think of the 1994 Tutsi genocide or indeed of the Republic of Rwanda without thinking about director Terry George's film Hotel Rwanda. In the DVD version of the film, Cheadle urges viewers to act on behalf of the victims in another African conflict in Darfur in South Sudan. His prominent involvement in the Save Darfur movement emphasizes the role of Western filmmaking and Western celebrities in the process of raising awareness about African conflicts. Thus, in this instance, film was used to initiate action against oppression happening in Africa. But, importantly, the film has been heavily criticized by film and history scholars, as well as many survivors for exaggerating Rusesa Bagina's heroism, ignoring the history behind the genocide, and for trivializing the violence. It must be understood that the Rwandan genocide had long-term causes that stretch back to the pre-colonial era through to the colonial entrenchment of ethnic hatred. The absence of any historical context for the Rwandan genocide in Hotel Rwanda makes the violence meaningless and only serves to reproduce the colonial narrative of Africa as a place filled with barbaric savages and where senseless violence is portrayed as a way of life. Thus, the film reduces the genocide as spontaneous violence without considering any of its historical roots. The film is also criticized for undermining the role of other key players, local and international, in protecting the lives of the hotel refugees. But its main criticism seems to stem from its dis dismissal of the reality of events at the Hotel des Mille Colini, in order to inflate Rusesa Bagina's heroic image so that it could fit into the discourse of dramatic heroes, similar to what was done with Oscar Schindler 
in Shinder's list. Lastly, Hotel Rwanda's good versus evil binary, a Hollywood plot, is dismissed by many Rwandans as a Western fabrication. Militainment refers to a new genre of military themed films that exhibit a high degree of collaboration between the entertainment industry and the US military industrial entertainment complex mediated by the Pentagon. These films seek to glorify the United States military at the expense of the others. This phenomenon is best illustrated by African American director Antoine Foucault's film Tears of the Sun of 2003 starring Bruce Willis. Alongside Militainment is the based on a true story narrative premise of the film that claims historical authenticity in its reconstruction of the Biafran War of 1967 to 1970. But in actual fact it results in a massive distortion of Nigerian history and misrepresentation of Africans at large. There are at least three kinds of distortions of the true story. One that falls back on the colonial presuppositions that Africans killing each other is a part of everyday life. A second that relies on the mythic sense of American exceptionalism and messianic heroism that the white American savior is the only one that can rescue the helpless Africans from themselves. And thirdly, one that relies on the US foreign policy line dictating that the Americans are the good guys and the bad guys are those deemed to be bad by the American military. Now, Tears of the Sun tells the story of an elite team of US Navy SEALs led by Lieutenant AK Waters, played by Willis, who are sent to Nigeria under strict orders to extract Dr. Vina Kendricks, played by Monica Bellucci, working for International Relief Services, and three missionaries from St. Michael's Mission behind enemy lines. Dr. Kendricks refuses to re leave without the Africans in her care. Waters then tricks the doctor by promising, promising to save her and her so-called natives and marches them all to the helicopter evacuation point with rebel soldiers in hot pursuit. But once she is in one of the helicopters, Waters shuts the doors and the helicopters take off abandoning the evacuated villages. Waters undergoes a crisis of conscience when, while flying over the mission station, he observes that the sick African patients who could not be evacuated, as well as the three white missionaries who chose to stay with them, have already been brutally massacred by the black rebel soldiers. Waters orders the chopper to turn around and, in defiance of his, superior, of his superior's orders, locates the African refugees he had earlier abandoned and, at the helicopter landing, and gets bogged down in a confrontation with the rebel troops in an attempt to protect and move the refugees to the Cameroonian border. Along the way, Waters' team stop a genocidal act in progress and also saves the Igbo tribal monarchy from extinction. As a result of his heroism, Waters pays a heavy price in the loss of men and is only saved in the end by the US Air Force. The rescued African refugees celebrate and praise Waters and Kendricks as they fly away from the African war zone to safety. Now, there are no strong or good Africans in this film. The Africans are either victims or killers, while the Western characters are either missionaries who lay down their lives, or a doctor like Kendricks who saves lives, or the Navy SEALs who sacrifice everything to fight and kill the so-called bad guys. Dr. Kendricks, a white American, calls the Africans my people. Willis plays the messiah figure whose ability to save the villages from genocide with limited men and equipment shows what John Michael Valentin refers to as the potential capacity of the US government and military of attaining sanctity. The American Salvation Discourse in Tears of the Sun is a product of the colonial civilizing discourse which has evolved into a so-called neo-messianism that not only asserts America's historically sacred mandate as protector, but which attributes the US and its military with divine powers. 
Fuqua claims that the events depicted in the film were caused by the 1966 Igbo military coup and that the film is a true account of events of the Biafran War, also known as the Nigerian Civil War or the Nigerian Biafran War of 1967-1970. However, this is a claim made more to boost the film's entertainment and commercial value at the expense of Nigeria's image. Rather than focusing on the Biafran War, Fuqua's account is instead a careful selection of certain elements of not only that war, but also of other African wars that are transplanted onto modern Nigerian geopolitics. The film is far from being a historical account of the Biafran War. Instead, it merely combines various African conflicts and exploits the current regional and religious strife in Nigeria to produce a contemporary version of the colonial image of Africa. Now, as we know, one of the characteristics of colonial representations of Africa is the generalization of Africa as one homogeneous entity without any political, economic, cultural or racial diversity. According to Dokatum, the DVD version of the film is accompanied by a great deal of information on every conceivable conflict in Africa. Its special features section includes the director's commentary, the interactive map of Nigeria, Africa fact file and Voices of Africa which are interviews with African refugees who acted on the set. These overload the film with information about civil wars but provide very little kind of rep very little treatment of Nigeria itself for a clear story that can give us insight into that particular African country. A kind of representation results in both historical distortion and a very negative portrayal of Nigeria and Africa. Although contemporary wars, famine and corruption in some African countries tend to validate catastrophic and alarmist narratives about Africa, these disasters are not representative of the entire continent, nor are they permanent features of individual countries. Thus, Fuqua's narrative only serves to reproduce a colonial reading of Africa. Great Lives biopics or grand national narratives serve to tell the fate of an African country through its leaders, but not necessarily through their eyes. Films about Nelson Mandela celebrate him as a universal symbol of endurance, forgiveness and reconciliation, but carefully evades the question of Western involvement in propping up the apartheid regime. Most of these films focus on a white perspective to interpret South African history on screen. This, in turn, hijacks and whitewashes South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle history altogether. Inevitably, the life of Mandela, arguably the leading African statesman of his time, is a favorite subject of these films. Mandela films set in the apartheid era de depict him as the hero of the struggle, while post-apartheid narratives of Mandela project the theme of forgiveness, reconciliation and national unity. Nel Nelson Mandela has been the subject of many films, some of which are Mandela of 1987, Sarafina of 1992, Mandela and the Clerk of 1997, Goodbye Bafana of 2007, Endgame of 2009, Invictus of 2009, Winnie Mandela of 2011 and Nelson Mandela Long Walk to Freedom of 2013. Some of the Mandela films attempt to reconstruct South African apartheid history while some lay emphasis on reconciliation by crafting a messi messianic image of Mandela as the father of the Rainbow Nation, while others are just a scramble by Hollywood studios for profits from the Mandela celebrity product. Hollywood played a role in bringing to the world's attention the atrocities of the apartheid system and in making visible an exceptional African hero. But as it's able to craft an African leader into a hero figure, so too is it able to craft and portray real-life villainous characters as it wants as well. In The Last King of Scotland of 2006, an adaptation of Giles Foden's novel of the same name, 
African-American actor Forrest Whitaker plays real-life Ugandan dictator Idi Amin. While the film is based on events during Amin's rule, the story is told through the perspective of a fictional character, a young Scottish doctor, Nicholas Garrigan, played by James McAvoy. We see Amin through, the white ga- through his white gaze. Initially, Garrigan is enchanted by Amin's charisma and eventually agrees to become the dictator's personal physi- physician. In the film, Amin is delighted to hear of Garrigan's Scottish nas- nationality, telling him that Scotland and Uganda share a common history as both have been resilient in their resistance to the English. However, Amin's charm and friendliness soon turns to fits of rage and increasing paranoia. In one scene, Amin laughingly informs Garrigan that his Scottish passport has been replaced with a Ugandan one, thus making it difficult for Garrigan to leave the country. Amidst the growing instability brewing in in Uganda, the passport becomes important because it's the Westerners' tool to escaping Africa. Without it, Garrigan cannot get out. He also bears witness to Amin's xenophobic policies against Uganda's Asian population and murders carried out against those who Amin suspects of undermining him, including the Ugandan health minister, as well as one of Amin's wives. However, the portrayal of Amin is somewhat sanitized by Whitaker in an attempt to subvert the pre-existing image of Amin as a villainous brute. Even during his rule, Amin was depicted by the international community, particularly by the West, as an erratic and unpredictable despot and in many ways came to represent the archetype of an African leader. In fact, it's argued by some that up until Nelson Mandela's release from prison, Amin was the most famous African but for all the wrong reasons. His caricature was built on pre-existing colonial stereotypes of African leaders as insane, stupid and unpredictable savages that was only perpetuated by Amin's behavior. Amin awarded himself many grandiose titles, from Big Daddy, to the claim that he was the uncrowned King of Scotland, to the incredibly long His Excellency, President for Life, Field Marshal, Al Haji, Dr. Idi Amin Dada, VC, DSO, MC, CBE, Lord of all the beasts of the earth and fishes of the seas, and conqueror of the British Empire in Africa in general and Uganda in particular. Yes, that is all one title. But at the same time, his more sinister side, such as his constant erratic behavior, was often emphasized by Western media. Amin became the subject of rumors including a widespread belief that he was a cannibal. He apparently also boasted that he kept the decapitated heads of political enemies in his freezer, although he joked that human flesh was generally too salty for his taste. As a consequence, Amin has been parodied on numerous occasions, most notably by the British comedian John Bird, who released the comedy album The Collected Broadcasts of Idi Amin in 1975. One of the songs from the album, Amazing Man, played at the beginning of this lecture and depicts Amin as a bombastic, homicidal and psychopathic brute who would do anything to boost his own ego even if it meant murdering the people entrusted to help him. In contrast, Whitaker aimed to represent a more human side to the dictator. Whitaker said, Initially, I had only very dark images of this man. I saw him as a big, angry maniac. But as I did more research, I began to have a different understanding. When you look at old footage, you can see Idi was also an extremely charming man. He was often said to be unintelligent, and yet he spoke 10 different languages. The challenge was to play a really complete character, not just a stereotypical image. Whitaker's performance moved the focus away from the historical Amin to the character Amin. It ultimately earned the character, ultimately earned the actor, 23 international awards, including the Academy Award for Best Actor in 2007. 
Colonial or imperial nostalgia refers to the reconstruction of the colonial experience in favorable ways, while covering up or ignoring its evils. White colonial societies portrayed in these kinds of films appear attractive and inviting. Furthermore, this feeling of nostalgia sanitizes racial domination to appear innocent and pure. Basically, all the movies discussed in this lecture exhibit colonial nostalgia in some form or other, especially since nostalgia operates in tandem with the civilizing mission of the white man's burden and its mandate to civilize the savage other. Such films also romanticize poverty, perpetuating the savage image of the other as a permanent reference point for white civilized identity. Now, Blood Diamond of 2006 is one of the new wave Hollywood Africa films that tries to move away from the old exotic representations of Africa. To an extent, it even critiques Western stereotypes about Africa by exploring the negative impact of American popular culture in Africa. In many ways, it transcends the parameters of entertainment to make a tremendous political and humanitarian statement. Set against the backdrop of the destructive Sierra Leone civil war of from 1991 to 2002, Blood Diamond stars Leonardo DiCaprio as Danny Archer, a white South African mercenary and diamond smuggler born in Rhodesia, which is present-day Zimbabwe, and Jamon Hunsu as Solomon Vandy, a Mendy fisherman who is forced to work in RUF rebel commander Colonel Poison's diamond mine. Archer and Solomon meet in prison where Archer discovers that Solomon Vandy has hidden a rare pink diamond worth millions of dollars. Motivated by the pink diamond, Archer manages to secure Vandy's release from prison and they embark on a journey through dangerous rebel territory to secure the rough diamond while Vandy hopes to find his son who has been abducted and recruited into rebel ranks. Archer wants the diamond. Solomon wants his son wants, wants his son back. Meanwhile, a white American journalist, Maddie Bowen, portrayed by Jennifer Connolly, feels a strong humanitarian commitment to Africa, but needs evidence to write a story to expose the blood diamond trade. All three need each other to find what they are looking for. Finally, Solomon gets his son. Maddie Bowen gets the story she needs through Archer and publishes it, while Archer gets the diamond but is also fatally wounded. Before he dies, he gives the diamond to Vandy and with the help of Bowen, Vandy sells the diamond in London for two million pounds. His family is flown to London in a private jet and he becomes the spokesman for Global Witness at the proceedings of the, Gim of the Kimberley process, which was a commitment to remove conflict diamonds from the global supply chain. The reception of the film and its negative impact on the world diamond trade attests to its power as a tool for advocacy against trading in illegal diamonds. For instance, the World Diamond Fraternity had to launch counter campaigns to encourage people to buy their diamonds because most people in the West would not commit to buying a diamond ring deemed to have cost someone in Sierra Leone a hand or an entire arm. But unfortunately, when the movie was released in 2006, the war in Sierra Leone had been over for four years and the diamond boycott as a result of the film hurt Africa's diamond industry, including that of Sierra Leone's, which badly needed the money for post-war reconstruction. The film also condemns the plunder of Sierra Leone's natural resources by multinational corporations feeding Western consumerism. The film states that in the epilogue the natural resources of a country are the sovereign property of the people. They are not ours to steal or exploit. To some extent, Blood Diamond attempts to reshape Western attitudes positively towards Africa. But despite the film's attempts to take its place as a voice of activism, it still cannot shake off its Western biases that it has towards Africa due to practical reasons. Blood Diamond is ultimately an American production, and thus it isn't really about Africa or Africans, but about American perceptions of Africa at the particular point 
and time of the film's production. The historical events portrayed in the film are based to a large extent on reality, but beneath the surface, Africa is still just another backdrop for American adventure stories with American superheroes. This new wave Hollywood Africa film still exhibits nostalgia for the old jungle films like King Solomon's Mines of 1950 and The African Queen of 1951 that were about Africa and made in Africa but were made by non-Africans. As such, these types of films condoned western style colonialism. The fascination of western media with Africa's calamities is evident in Blood Diamond and racist cliches abound are abound in the film, although these attitudes are not as overt as in the old colonial films. In fact, in Blood Diamond, these stereotypes are even contested in characters such as Solomon Vandy and particularly Maddie Bowen. The critical edge of the film reflects changing times, but there's still evidence of colonial nostalgia through the representation of Africa as a place of mystery, romance and exploitation. In the movie, during a conversation between Archer and the black owner of a beachfront bar in Freetown, Sierra Leone, we are introduced to an acronym TIA, which stands for This is Africa. The term is used derog derogatory by Archer, and as well as Maddie Bowen and Archer's boss, Colonel Kutsia, played by South African actor Arnold Fossler. It underscores the dangers and chaos of Africa. This acronym, popularized by Blood Diamond, has become the quintessential summary of Africa's danger, incompetency, bureaucratic ineptness, and lawlessness. In addition, while we see African actors in major roles and a certain degree of historical authenticity, again, as in Tears of the Sun, we find the homogenous map of Africa the racist cliches, the negative generalizations about Africa based on the experiences of one country, the white superhero and savior, the beautiful and naive white girl, and the black savage. American historian Curtis Kim suggests that the old colonial portrayals of, the, of Africa may have collapsed due to advances in anthropology and the demise of settler colonialism, and that the increasing casting of Africans in contemporary Hollywood has greatly reduced the overtly racist statements that the colonial stories carried. However, that does not mean Hollywood representation of Africa is now positive or has improved. Instead, this means that the stereotyping of Africa has only become more covert rather than growing less prevalent. In conclusion, we have seen that despite the advent of the post-colonial era, stereotypes of Africa conjured up during the colonial era have survived and have been recycled and reproduced by Hollywood. Although these kinds of representations are far more veiled than their colonial predecessors, they are still existent and are utilized to perpetuate a certain image that the West has of Africa and Africans. Post-colonial Africa is still depicted as an exotic, homogenous entity which is inhabited by the descendants of the cannibalistic savages of, co of colonial times. Africans are still depicted as helpless and dependent on white saviors to rescue them from their own strife. In a post-colonial setting, this kind of narrative implies that Africans are not capable of governing themselves. They need Bruce Willis or Leonardo DiCaprio to save them from the situation they themselves created. This kind of narrative is harmful and only serves to sustain the racist col colonial stereotypes. However, thanks largely to Hollywood's heterogeneous nature, there has been pushback from within Hollywood. Recently, more and more movies about Africa are showing signs of critique against these kinds of representations. In 2018, the film adaptation of Marvel's popular comic Black Panther was released. The movie, directed by African-American Ryan Coogler and starring Chadwick Boseman as the African superhero, completely subverted African stereotypes by not only introducing a black African savior for the world, 
but also critiquing and problematizing the effects of colonialism in Africa. It also showcased a completely other Africa, one that was assertive and not dependent on Western aid at all. But the film not only undermines stereotypes of Africa and Africans, it also questioned the long-held belief that movies about Africa starring black actors in leading roles would not be financially viable for Hollywood. Black Panther grossed 700.1 million US dollars in the United States and Canada and 646.9 million US dollars in other territories for a worldwide total of 1.347 billion US dollars. It became the highest grossing solo superhero film, the ninth highest grossing film of all time and the highest grossing film by a black director. Thus, currently, there seems to be a momentum shift away from the old representations of Africa and Africans. Whether this shift is maintained by Hollywood remains to be seen.